This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, so I'm back. It's been a crazy week. Just trying to get some stuff done. Things have been slow at work, so I've been working on other things. I uh, painted a little bit. I got some other stuff taken care of that I've been working on for a while, such as I proved that the existence of an infinite number that does not repeat, such as pi, disproves the concept of a simulation theory for all of existence and therefore we are in a prime universe because it wouldn't be possible for an infinite number to exist without being inside of a simulated container so a simulated container cannot contain an infinite number even though it's just a number the information of the knowledge of that number and how it would extend would prevent that thing from existing within a simulation and that was on my mind for a long time and finally got rid of that so I feel way better about that Went back to painting, played a little, uh, couple games here and there. Feel good about it. So I uh, hope you guys have been uh, as productive, getting stuff done. And uh, let's talk about the games that came out. First up is some information just on things that were uh, on GameFound, not on Kickstarter. Uh, Monster Evasion has already ended, but GameFound is kind of like the pledge manager and the crowdfunding source at the same time. So uh, you should be able to just go in there, make an account with GameFound if you don't have one already. And if you wanted to continue to pre-order the stuff that's in there, you can do that. Uh, Monster Invasion is four different games from Sandy Peterson. Um, it didn't do a crazy amount of money, so I don't know if this is going to be uh, their premier place to premiere games. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe in the future it'll start to pick up. It just doesn't have the the reach if you could you could go to kickstarter looking for something else and then stumble on a game whereas with game found you can't really stumble across um, something that you were looking for something else so it's going to take a little while for people to uh, catch up to it it was okay as far as um the amount of money that it made but i think he normally makes um many times more when he goes to kickstarter so we'll just see how that goes campaign that was also on game found that did much better uh, over two million dollars, or sorry, two million euros, which is over two million dollars, was Robinson Crusoe, the collector's edition. This has been one of those games that people say is a top solo game because of its difficulty, and um, you know you get some deluxe premier things that the people behind GameFound Awaken Realms can offer, such as the Sun Drop uh, application of paint to your plastic models, so that when you get them, they look better than the um, regular just base uh, plastic looks. You get a lot of detail and uh, contrast out of the basically Zenithal process. You can go to my uh, Nemesis painting videos. You can see how you could do it yourself if you wanted to. Um, one of the other things that I would like you to know is I did get one uh, Lords of Ellis. I got uh, sun dropped and it's hard to paint over. So it would take a whole big thing to restrip it back down and um, try to paint any of the, the pieces that go along with it. So if you don't like the way that the sun drop looks and you think, oh, I'll just get a sun drop now and then I'll repaint it later, know that you're going to have a huge problem stripping it out. Uh, it's not a problem, but it's going to take time. You can do it with uh, some good old simple green and an uh, ultrasonic cleaner, no problem. But uh, that's what you're going to end up having to do. It's not something you just paint on top of. So like I said, just contact them for late pledges. You'll be fine. Then on Kickstarter, we start off with the Korean War. And um, this is one of those uh, types of war games where you have the square um, little uh, wooden pieces or cardboard, whatever they are, that have the unit information on them. And then you use the battle maps uh, to fight. This takes place between 1950 50 and 51. So it is only the first year of the Korean War. And a lot of people call it the Forgotten War. Um, the US is there and that's where MASH takes place and all that kind of stuff but a lot of people just don't know it or who the players were or understand it um, it was not necessarily a big success uh, for the US and technically we are there are the Korean people are still at war but I lived in Korea for a year about a decade ago and wow at this point I think it's over a decade um, you talk to the people there they're like we're at war still I don't know <laughs> it's been it doesn't bother them at all. They've got stuff to do. They've got school to go to. they got work to take care of and all that. But technically, they were under arms this, and it's still going on. And uh, there's not a lot of games that take place there. So if you've been thinking about a different theater, a different war, a different time, a different technology, a different place, you can check out Korean War, 
and uh, go get some kimchi and bibimbap and make it a real experience. And then we have a robot racing game. This is Scrap Racer by Queen Games. Queen Games is a big player on uh, Kickstarter. They've had over 60, and uh, the reason why they're able to do over 60 is they fulfill them. So if you like the game, they're uh, generally family friendly, not too much violence in anything that they put out, and uh, they're constantly getting upgraded with new features. This one has acrylic tiles, as you can see the robots there, that will be the um, standees for the different characters. So it's not just cardboard that can fray as you pop things in and out of the stands. These ones are going to be acrylic and they should last quite a while. I would still suggest maybe spraying them with a high gloss uh, or high visibility, either a Mod Podge or um, some type of uh, other sealer. Krylon or one of the others, they might off gas, but uh, I think uh, one of the Vallejo ones would be just fine. And that will uh, keep it... Uh, the paint from getting uh, scraped off or anything like that for a very long time but that's just me your kids will probably grow out of this for ages eight and above way before anything would uh would go bad <laughs> but uh you know it's something that maybe you can pass on to another generation and uh, it'll still be rugged enough for them there's some expansions you can get for other racers different uh stages it's a bit like the pod racing from star wars robots running around in a circle and uh, doing everything they can to get in front of each other. So that's the theme. Then going to the past instead of the future, we have Wild Wild West, the Roll and Write Revolution. So obviously a Roll and Write game. This one is about managing a town and uh, you can compete or play by yourself, one to six players as the game is designed. And one of the interesting things that the game has built into it is strategic failure. So you have to pick battles. The game is designed so that you will not be able to do everything. You will have to pick the, the battles that mean the most to you in order to get to the end. That's an interesting concept because a lot of people, uh, they just think, oh, win, 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 and they don't look at the bigger picture. So I think that it's about time that some of these things pop in and uh, make it so that uh, there is a point when you have to make a strategic retreat. One place always trying to win that will shoot you in the foot is at an auction, such as with Galleria, where you are going to be bidding on famous works of art, and some of them are worthless forgeries. And you will be competing with, uh, get some like cards that work as Monopoly money, basically, and uh, there's 21 unique works of art, but there are 125 cards, which means there's going to be a lot of forgeries. They're uh, going to be created by the make playing cards people. I have bought some stuff from them and the playing cards are the same exact quality, linen finish, all that kind of fun stuff that you would get in any game. So uh, it just seems to be the way that they're going to put it. They're not planning it to be a giant campaign, but it might be a lot of fun for somebody. They're about halfway funded and uh, it is going to be ending soon, but uh, you'll still have plenty of time to pick it up if you wanted to increase your knowledge of art and ability to spot a forgery. Then the evil empire of cool many are not returns. This time Marvel United gets the X-Men. And it is specifically the X-Men of the 90s. The Chris Claremont version. Um, I had a lot of these comics. They were, I think before Jim Lee started drawing them. Around the time uh, that they're trying to capture. They're ch all chibi style. So they got the big heads. They look like the X-Babies. I don't know if you remember that from Mojo World. When they made these um, miniaturized versions. Uh, like child versions of the X-Men. And they were running around. And they had different names. So instead of Storm it was like Gale. So it was like lower smaller versions of, of their names as well. It was kind of cute. And it was funny for a little bit. Muppet Babies was big on TV at the time. So it all fit with the same deal. Uh, if you've already played Marvel United, then this is a no-brainer for you. It's more of the same. You get a lot of cool stuff. You can pick up the original game. You can pick up a lot of different uh, add-ons that go along with it. Um, there's different pledge levels and cool things that go. I'm not going to pick it up because it's just too much stuff, and I'd rather just have the comic books at this point. I've got enough uh, cool mini or not things. I do like that they've implemented uh, characters such as Shadow King, Callisto, Deathbird, uh, Arcade, Sauron. Those are all characters that work pretty well to um, have a story that you have to fight against with a lot of people. So we'll see how all that works out. They're making more than enough money hand over fist, and I'm sure it'll be in your local game store if you don't catch it now. 
And then we have a weird competition with Shadow Planet, the board game. The idea here is you're going to play your turn, but you can switch characters between the turns. And uh, I like the idea. It's got a very pulp feel to it, which pulp sci-fi uh, crossed with Nemesis is uh, an interesting idea. Um, everybody, each one of the characters has their own decks at, uh, and how it's going to run. It's That part's fine, pretty standard. But the idea is on the next turn, somebody may take the cards that you've built your character in, uh, up with and use them for themselves. So you're going to keep trying to create objectives and use these characters to facilitate those objectives, but you're not going to be fully in control all the time of the same ones. So it's an interesting way to screw each other over. There's also a timer, so um, you do kind of have to work together at the same time. It's, uh, it's an interesting concept. Like I say, art style is uh, something that works for me. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to pick this one up just yet because I don't have the three people at a time to play with. But uh, I do hope it funds because it does sound interesting and unique in its own way. And uh, that's a good time for me. Then we have a good game for like a ninth, 10th grade biology class or science class. This is Cellulose, a plant cell biology game. Cellulose is the um, material that is on cell walls unique to plants. It's what gives uh, cardboard and wood and all that its strength. And um, this is about breaking down the cells. Any biology class or any science class in like an elementary school that might have cell parts, I would recommend something like this to help visualize how it all functions. Even in 10th grade, we had to do a ballet that we had to write ourselves based on the Krebs cycle. Rather than all that, we could have just played this game and uh, nobody would have got dropped, okay? So um, it's something simple, uh, pretty neat, one to five players, uh, like I say here, but it was probably best utilized with a student. So I think any teachers out there, science teachers, that kind of stuff, or at-home teachers, you might find this to be a fun way to describe how cells work, and that could lead you into having a future doctor, or botanist, or biologist, or zoologist, or some other kind of ologist in your family. And then while I lived in Korea, I know almost nothing about K-pop other than it is like a factory system, and people are trained to be in these um, singing machine groups, and that's what you're going to be here. They are going to train you as a player. You're going to move around the board, moving through the system, trying to grow, and uh, I don't think there's any actual singing required as part of it, but um, it is a little bit like a... Uh, car factory and the way that they create people and I know that none of the students that I had listened to any of the music that we have in America right now uh, from Korea uh, they had Wonder Girls they had uh, FT Island and a bunch of other ones and those people are in jail right now <laughs> a bunch of them for these weird scams and things they were pulling I don't know if that's included in the game but that would be awesome if it was uh, I think it's trying to be a little more uh, friendly to the idea of the K-pop machine than uh, anything else. So uh, if you were interested in that and you got a bunch of, with the, the BTS, uh, to me that still means behind the scenes, but okay, sure. Um, if fans or any of the other people that are out there, um, then maybe they'll be interested in this type of game. And then we have the domain of Mirza Noctis from Hexplorit. This is a very nice looking uh, hex game for basically a replacement of uh, an RPG. So if you're going to want to run around in the darkness, they uh, are providing minis by Reaper. I'm going to guess that other Reaper minis will also fit into the same tiles if you pick them up that way. I have some Reaper minis that I painted I have at the end of the episode if you want to check those out. But this is also on GameFound. This one is still live. You can pick it up uh, until early May. They've got some stretch goals and things going on, but they're doing pretty well. Almost $300,000 picked up so far. There is some uh, write-on aspects of this so that you'll be able to uh, continue to play in much different ways if you want to. But otherwise, you're going to get witches, uh, uh, phosphoromancers, whatever those are, 
as well as warlocks, bards, the typical things that you would find in your uh, fantasy world. So if you aren't able to play in Ravenloft, if you want to play something grimdark, then maybe this will be some uh, thing for you to play instead of um, Van Richten's when it comes out, as you can play this solo and you can't do it with other uh, RPGs. So the art looks fantastic. You can see it for yourself. If you want something similar, but it's not in that dark world, then maybe Legends of Void will be for you. There are hexes, there are heroes, and different factions. You can play 20 different heroes in this Euro-style game. And uh, there's dragons and other cool stuff, but you're going to be building an engine in a steampunk, not quite spell jammer kind of world that mixes magic and uh, technology. So if you want to, you can play it by yourself and that's all fine and good. There's going to be uh, some like angels called seraphs and different things that you're also going to be competing with in uh, almost an Arabian uh, Nights kind of a, a world from the look of things. Um, there is a dragon with a city on its back. You can see there on the bottom left. Uh, the hex uh, world is the different regions as you go through collecting your resources, building your, your uh, kingdom as best you can building up your best hero and uh, fighting the good fight so i think it's interesting as a concept and uh you know being able to play solo is very helpful but hopefully you'll be able to get some friends in too as uh, the world looks pretty neat i do like on the bottom right the dragon with the city on its back then we have disparity trap which has a video that is four minutes long that is the best four minutes i think of describing um the race discussion for you in America. It is not going to talk in a way that talks down to you. It's not going to talk in a way that says one person over another or anything like that. The game itself is about just setting um, advantages and disadvantages between people, but it's not specifically going to go into one race or another so that you can continue to play as a concept of one group versus another, not necessarily defining those groups. So it's not going to be uh, one and over with uh, the first time you play it, you can play it a few times and laugh about things that you had or didn't have when you were at a point in your life when you didn't have much. Um, the lady's very funny. The writing on it is very funny in that video. I would check it out. There, It's not a game for everybody. It's definitely a game if you're going to run a sociology class. But the video is for everybody. It's pretty funny. The thing about the potato salad and all that, like that, that is true. There are people that are... Uh, they put a lot of things in their potato salad, and then there are people that want none of it. You can get an egg, you can get some mayonnaise and a potato, and maybe celery and for those types of people. And then there's other folks that will try and put cranberry raisins and walnuts and all kinds of other things into it till it's no longer a potato salad. It, this, this, it's, it's a big part of the video, and it's funny. Then we have the transmissions board game. This is a worker placement with little robots that are pretty neat looking. And uh, it says that it is... A rondelle system which means you won't be able to take the same action over and over again uh, that's going to create limits that uh, means you have to keep changing things up the little robots are not 3d for everything you have to get the deluxe version and uh, yeah I mean that part makes you kind of sad because they are cute but uh, I get it um, artwork is pretty fantastic in its own um, little cartoony um, I don't want to call it wall e because it doesn't have treads but it's like a cross between wall e and the iron giant kind of fashion um so if you're into worker placement you like these cute little robots then uh i think adam west not batman uh, has something really neat for you that you can give a shot and uh, try out i like the idea of not being able to take the same action over and over again because it does change the way that you handle your strategies then we have the game of Brixes. this is a monster battle board game that uses ar and the cards look a lot like Pokemon, I will be honest with you, and that probably is preventing it from um, reaching its full potential, is because it just looks too similar to Pokemon. Um, the other thing is the AR arena part of it, uh, not a lot of people know that their devices can support it, so it's having kind of a hard time, but it is an interesting concept. Um, eventually it's going to take off, Eventually, it's going to be a lot easier to use, but right now, since we're just looking through phones or tablets, it can be a little bit hard to, to kind of figure out. And I think that's 
what's holding this campaign back. It only has, uh, let's see, it has two backers <laughs> right now, and it needs a whole lot more than that for it to be fully functional. But it is an interesting concept, and um, you know the artwork and everything. If you can get past the the analogs to uh, Pokemon and uh, other card games that have existed before, and think of it more as a uh, a means to get to this AR technology, then uh, it might be something fun at your table because a lot of people use apps. Then we have a second printing of Canvas, and this is a very interesting game. It uh, functions in layers. You get these plastic cards that you try to make a picture out of by um, either flipping them around or um, just making them match in different ways and that allows you to fulfill the needs of uh, certain cards that you've been given. And the layering of it is very similar to the way that you uh, would paint. So you're going to take an object that's in your head, in this case an object in your hand, and you're going to start with the background and you're going to move your way to the foreground. And uh, that's how this game runs. It's, it's an interesting way to create a painting in real time with these uh, simple plastic pieces and cards that uh, definitely inspires um, a lot of interesting ideas and um, different, it's hard to describe. It's cool that you can make a painting into a board game in a way that creates itself like a painting creates itself. And a lot of people have a hard time thinking in those uh, layered ways. And uh, there's no wonder it's it's a very, very successful project. It's probably going to be well over a million dollars by the time it finishes. And that's why it's in a second printing is because people like it. So if you want to try it out, something that doesn't have a lot of written explanation, you can play it with people that don't necessarily speak the same language as you. And... Uh, explain it to people pretty quickly and have a good time and play it solo if you want to then we have gem seekers which is trying to enter the trading card space basically as a replacement for pokemon magic the gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh. and i don't think it's gonna happen um they need two hundred thousand dollars and so far 25 people have been able to jump on the art looks all very nice. It looks like they spent a lot of money on it. But the hard thing is you're in this space where you're going to have to spend a lot of money. And lots of people try to make lots of different games. I remember Illuminati, X-Files. Um, they're just hundreds, literally, of card games came out when Magic the Gathering first got started in the 90s. And try to hit that same um, space. Werewolf, uh, Vampire the Masquerade. I mean, there's just so many of them. And they all flopped. And the reason for that is there really is only room for one or two big games uh, to be sustainable because you have to have a community that is also playing along with you and willing to spend the money on the booster packs. And right now, the all of the card games, even the ones that are self-contained, are having a hard time um, getting picked up. And there's just no room. Nobody's willing to jump on and uh, take on a new um, game unless it has some extremely popular uh, unknown new quantity. And then also hard is running a religion. That's what Alter Ego is about. You're going to play a god and you're going to get followers. And you have to use tweezers and that will help you place the villagers on these stackable altars that look like the things that uh, you find inside of a pizza box. So uh, it's possible that you will be the, the number one uh, deity. Um, they look pretty neat. They're a little plain in the colors in the way that they've chosen. They look very uh, stone color of brown and that also mixes with the stone color of the um, altars itself. So I would have told them, like, hey, maybe make them pop a little more. Uh, but otherwise, it's an interesting idea. The tweezer thing makes it uh, a bit like Jenga. Uh, so you don't try to knock anything over. But, um, yeah, if you want something with a little bit of dexterity to go along with uh, the rest of the stuff that's involved in the game stuff, with rolling the dice and following the, um, the different uh, requirements for the temples, then maybe this will be a good one for you. And, yeah, I don't see it being part of any particular religion uh, or 
putting one above any others so it should be fine even if you're going to play it uh, at a church on a Sunday or Saturday uh, board game day it won't be offensive then we have the Arkham Horror Chaos Tokens, the regular cardboard ones that come with the game. Once they go in the Chaos Bag, they can rub a little and the cardboard can start to fray. So I can understand why they would need uh, a plastic version. I have solved this problem on my own by buying uh, coin capsules and putting those in there. They're very inexpensive and uh, allows you to use the same artwork that's on the, um, the, that's printed on the paper that goes on the cardboard. Um, so you don't lose anything and it is a fairly permanent solution. This is a different way of going about that. This is a monochrome version though because these are laser engraved onto clear plastic and although they look nice it can be very difficult to see what's actually on the, um, the pieces at night or in a not perfectly lit room. So that's just a caveat that you could throw out there. Uh, it's a fairly expensive process to engrave all of these things because it's probably done with a laser. Ah, it even says that it's done with a laser. That is a very time-consuming way of doing it, and that will make these expensive. But that is up to you if you like the aesthetic of it. Uh, they look nice. They look like they're cut out of glass, which, you know, obviously they're not. They're plastic. Or if you need something cheaper, like I said, you can uh, just get some coin capsules with a little... Uh, razor blade and cut off the little nubs that um, you know from being taken off the sprue and it'll be just as effective and just as durable uh, this might actually be less durable depending on the amount of oil and different things on your fingers so just things to think about as you go across and uh, make decisions you may even want to paint the back side of some of these with different colors to make it easier to pop out different thoughts then we have Bar Fight. This is a trick-taking game where you are supposed to be at a theater of a bar with uh, weapons of your uh, drinks, whatever your varieties are, and the conquest of the judges. So depending on how you steal cards, move cards, do things back and forth, you are going to be able to hopefully connect, collect enough uh, judge cards in order to gain points and uh, make it work for you. Here's the thing, I mean, not everybody's into cocktails and mixology. Some people just like having a beer. It's gonna depend on the type of culture you are in. Um, some cities are better for this than others. Some groups are better than the, at this than others. And, you know, you gotta think about it. Am I an adult? Well, are any of my friends like former, uh, I guess you're never a former alcoholic, <laughs> so, it's like sometimes you can invite those people over for this kind of thing and it'll be a lot of fun and then other times you invite them over and then they start thinking about booze and you have to you know pick them up from jail so just just know where you're putting it, picking it up from speaking of picking up you might have to uh connect your flights and that's what the connecting flights is about this is airline management while we still have airlines they uh, have not had the best run of things in the last few decades uh, one to five players, so there's a solo mode. You can play cooperative if you want. It's an engine builder. It's kind of neat, the idea of uh, hopping around different places. Uh, as far as travel goes, um, I don't know how much longer Amazing Race is going to be uh, on television. It's the 20-something season, so who knows if it'll continue for much longer. But uh, you could theoretically play yourself in your own version of that kind of uh, competition. Whereas uh, you're trying to move people around the world and do other fun, unique things that uh, each have their own problems. Uh, artwork is pretty good. Uh, it's actually, it, you know, takes place not in a future aspect or a future world, but in ours. And um, if you are used to traveling or that was your job before, then uh, maybe this is the type of game that might get you back into the idea of it. Uh, there's pluses and minuses, you know, with the old world, <laughs> the pre. Uh, uh, sickness world that uh, maybe the next one will be a little better and, but it is time to start thinking about getting back to normal and maybe this type of game will help you do that and then we have a very different tabletop of a tabletop game this is Q games and this is supposed to be done with billiard balls on uh, a type of billiard table so it's different um, toppers felt uh, I'm not sure if it's velcro or exactly what it is that uh, sets it in there but you're able to play a variety of games where you move the 
pieces around, but they're the billiard balls. It's an interesting concept. Uh, it takes, I don't know if it will fit all of those little pool tables that, that you used to get at Toys R Us. Um, it was like an air hockey table, pool table, a bunch of other things all at the same time. Maybe there's a card table that you could also modify to make this work. But uh, if you're one of the people that knows exactly what this is, then it's for you. And uh, more power to you. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, it did get funded with only 16 people. So, um, yeah, I just hope that the, the change out of the different tables, of the different uh, sheets, they're not glued down necessarily. So I hope it uh, has a way to make sure that it sticks well to the sides and that the game is fun. If you're interested in it, if you got people that don't necessarily want to play pool, nine ball, eight ball, that kind of thing, but maybe they try something else, this will be an opportunity for you to work on your vocabulary, your astronomy, calculation, or clowns, I guess. And then we have hibernation. So this is one of, I think Electric Bees was the last one. There's been a few bee-related games. I think there might actually be more B games and there are bees that I see in a normal uh, uh, springtime and uh, this one it's worker placement it's got some interesting uh, looking artwork uh, that goes along with it you're going to do everything you can to be the head queen bee um, you have queen zizzy in the center of your space and then uh, each player if you're going to do teams you can do teams you pick workers you pick drones and uh, you do your best with them so you're going to get some specialty tiles you're going to lay those tiles around and uh the best orientation of those tiles is what's going to make you win um i don't know how big these are necessarily but they look like they might be fairly sizable in which case it'll take up a significant amount of uh table space but uh i think it's like a hexagonal dominoes basically in the way that it plays out and then one way to be successful is to outright come out and say that you're better than another successful game. This is Magical Unicorn Quest, Unicorn Trader, wherein they uh, start out by saying this is the game that Unstable Unicorn should be. I don't know, I haven't played Unstable Unicorns to know what it is, but uh, it's a card game. You're going to be a mystical being that you can play various um, bats, rabbits, other kind of stuff. You play potions, and uh, after you've discarded down to seven cards, you make a journey through the card that you laid down. Uh, this is supposed to be how some type of adventurer makes their way through the world. It looks a little bit like, um, what is it? Uh, it's not Pathfinder Quest, it's Munchkin Quest. And uh, the way that you're gonna like lay out the cards and create the adventure based on the, the ones that you've laid down and move through uh, some type of epic layer. Um, that part's fine. I don't know how it stacks up, like I say, to uh, Unstable Unicorns because I didn't pick that up. But I think if you're a unicorn person, there's probably room for you to play both games. Uh, I don't know that this one necessarily is going to make it into every target the way that Unstable Unicorns did. But uh, it does look like it's pretty close to backing. And, you know, some people like unicorns. I like painting them up as zombie unicorns in uh, uh, Green Horde. But uh, whatever works for you works for you. And then we have a game called Dark Pass by Cause, and the idea here is it's functionally a solo um, dungeon crawl, but the dungeon is the sewers of Paris in the 1850s, and uh, you have a flip book that's spiral bound, you have some models and characters that you can use, and uh, by flipping the pages of the spiral bound book, it becomes a map of about 100 feet long. So it's an interesting concept. Uh, we've seen a couple of different um, versions of these types of games put out by Cause in the past, and uh, it is a compelling solo experience. So if you weren't able to play one of the much bigger games that are out there uh, because they required too many people, then uh, this is for you. This is for you to have just at your own little table playing through uh, an interesting adventure in a weird place uh, as much as you want. Now, even today, they find weird things in the sewers of Paris. They found theaters like that had projectors where people were watching movies and having raves and all kinds of stuff. I don't know why nobody's mapped it, but uh, it's a crazy, crazy setup. If you want to watch the movie As Above, So Below, that is about weird things you can find in there. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Perdita Weeks is actually pretty good in it. 
And it's an interesting horror movie if you want that. So you get the game, you get the movie, you can decide, you can do both. Then we have the Ultimate Stocks game. I will tell you that these economic games are very helpful to kids in elementary school to try to figure out how business is actually done. And this one allows you to emulate a market. We did it in fourth grade, I think, and we just used a regular newspaper, but kids don't have newspapers anymore, right? Everything's on the internet. So you have to do things a little bit differently to make up for that not having to run down the tickers and everything and um, try to learn what the symbols mean and all that other stuff. It's a little harder to do just off web pages that are constantly changing, whereas the uh, newspapers that I used were very static and it was easier to figure out what was going on because it was the same time after time. Um, the idea here, at least the colors and text and all that will uh, be consistent between the different types of experiences and the different types of stocks and companies that will be used and they even look like share certificates so people can have an understanding of what that looks like even though we don't really use that as much anymore it's mainly like an old uh we need to uh, pick up the bearer bonds or uh you know like the something that was lost in a trunk and the bad guys are trying to get it in a in a movie from the 80s or whatever um but it's very helpful for kids to have an understanding of what the ownership of something more abstract like a stock is then out of the UK, we have the Geek & Son Bristol board game table. There have been a lot of board game tables uh, recently that have made a whole lot of money. This one has done pretty well. Uh, the UK is a smaller market. These things are hard to ship because they're so large. So basically, you wait for a regional campaign so you don't lose an arm and a leg. This one has LEDs in it. Uh, as you can see, if that's what you want to do, there are several different models, as you can see on the right, based on the amount of space that you have. Uh, but it is nice to be able to have the topper... So you can set your game up, have dinner, pull the topper back off, and uh, still continue playing. You don't have to sit there and think, oh, I've taken up my whole room because I don't want to stop playing the game, but I still have other things I need to do. Or, you know, just lots of things that go through my mind that, that would be uh, helpful to have multi-functional space like this. Then we have another economics-based game, but this one is a little more farmyard, and this is carrots. So you're going to be using rabbits of various types, such as tax collectors and gamblers and other types of farmers, uh, to get the most carrots. So it's very Bugs Bunny in its uh, economy, but uh, it is something that works pretty well. Younger ages will be able to figure out how to play it. You will need a couple of people, including yourself, in order to uh, make it happen. And uh, Easter's already over, but this one, I think it's supposed to ship by, I don't see where the actual ship time is, November. So if you are already harvesting, and um, maybe you'll be able to pick this up and play it next spring, thinking about uh, things to do with the kiddos, that kind of stuff, then maybe this will work for you. Um, it says 10 and up, but maybe if your kids know their numbers and you can explain a couple things to them as far as the rules, you can go younger. Then we have Karaoke AF, and the problem with this is it says there's a how to play, but it doesn't really show you how to play or what any of it means. So I can't necessarily recommend that this is a complete game. Um, it might be a starting idea, it might be fun for somebody, but I can't figure out how it would be fun for you because they're doing a terrible job, uh, a non-existent job, of really showing how this game works or how it's intended where you would play it, where you get these songs, where you get the systems. Is this only for karaoke studios? Is this only for people that have Filipino neighbors? Like, what is it that uh, it doesn't explain? So, unfortunately for those 14 people that did back it, I don't think it's going to make it all the way through. But hopefully on the next round, they will learn their lesson and put on the front page how the game actually works. Instead of just a bunch of people shrieking in the video, explain how uh, the game is supposed to function, how it's supposed to be fun, how it's a game, how it's more than just randomly picking a page in the karaoke book and then doing whatever you want with it. And another one that doesn't tell you how it's supposed to be fun is Woke, and I think it's just supposed to be insulting. Like, it's supposed to be pointing a finger at somebody, and I don't see it as fun. It's just a bunch of people ganging up on one person for something. 
So it really depends on the level of, uh, I don't know, security you have that you'd be able to play a game like this. I think this is one of those, they're called a game, but it's uh, it's just a, like a, a something therapists would love because it'll send you into one, uh, especially for the people that are fairly sensitive, don't want a lot of attention. There are introverts and extroverts into this world, and... I think it's just going to hurt some people. So, um, 20 people have backed it. Yeah, I hope that they uh, have the right audience. And then we have a game that's more woke than the woke game. <laughs> and still equally not funny, but at least it's honest about it. Um, this is not that funny. And um, it's much, much better than the other ones. It is... Uh, like they say, they say it's supposed to pull out truths from uh, behind everyday jokes about marginalized people. So I don't think this is going to do well necessarily in anything east of Riverside. But I think there's some groups that might enjoy this type of uh, discussion. But those are going to be the people that are already discussing race. Um, I, I just don't think it's... As f my standard is, are you going to be able to be as funny as Cards Against Humanity? Are you going to have as much of a good time as somebody playing Cards Against Humanity? And the last couple here, based on their themes, I would have to say no. And then we have an actual game. About an actual game. The game of basketball. This is Time Out. Um, the, it says it's for basketball fans. I don't see that it is officially licensed by the NBA, so I don't know if that logo is going to work. Um, they, would, they would be best off by getting rid of anything that is uh, having license issues. Only two people have backed it, each one for a dollar, and they need $50,000 to make this work. I don't see it making it to the end. What I do think it needs to do, one, get rid of the licensing, uh, unless they're actually paying the teams. And in which case I understand why it would cost $50,000 because that's probably just to use the logo. Um, and change up the way that it shows the, the rest of the game. Because I don't know why I would play this instead of just going outside and playing basketball. I know a lot of folks, it rains, it snows, it floods, it has blizzards. You know, maybe you'd be able to play it uh, then if you're into it. But they just don't explain how the, uh, the game runs very well. Um, to make it as exciting and interesting as a game of basketball. Uh, maybe this would be something more for coaches, might be helpful for them, but maybe on the next round. And then finally, at least we have another one that's an actual game. This is Movie Mix-Up, so you're going to have movies and you're going to have to mix and match the actors that were in them. Um, here's the thing, this is a UK based game. Does that mean that the movies are from the UK? Uh, are they only American movies? It's hard to say. You got to really nail down who um, or who are the actors and who are the people in the movies. If you give me a bunch of Bollywood actors, not gonna know. But you know who's gonna know? Like two billion people <laughs> that are not in the United States. Um, there's a lot of people. I watch British TV a lot, so I see some of the folks. Like Catherine Ryan is totally unknown in the United States. She's popular. In, uh, as a comedian in England, she's Canadian. Do they even know her in Canada? Couldn't tell you. But are all those big markets? Absolutely, and something that might be confused when picking up this game. So it's, uh, it's like the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon game. It fits within that same kind of world and is that exact same audience. Um, but the other thing is, movies are generational. Um, like from Raiders of the Lost Ark, Star Wars, all that kind of stuff. I'll know all those types of movies. You want to tell me every Michael Dudikoff movie, every American Ninja, I'll know right off. But I don't know what the hell came out recently. So, you know, you got to know the audience to explain that a little better. It'll get more traction. And that's everything. So I figure might as well throw the uh, long-awaited stuff I've been painting uh, onto this episode, which is pretty cool. Uh, I will get these things out early and I'll enjoy my weekend, so that'll be awesome. This is the uh, Necromantic Dragon. I figured uh, that the Red Dragon from Green Horde would be the regular base uh, I'm Alive type dragon, and I figured this one would be the Undead Zombie one. 
but I wanted it to be a kind of fresh, not like it's been hundreds of years old and a skeleton dragon, but that it's still you know on its state of decay. So I tried to uh, use a lot of dry brushing to make it look like the skin has lost its luster, so it's no longer red, but it's starting to dry out and uh, just otherwise look sickly. But it's an old dragon. It's bigger than the red dragon, so it probably died of old age. It's missing a horn, and uh, I just thought that it was uh, it was a pretty cool look for this guy. Again, this one's from Green Horde. Zombicide. Fantasy. And the reason I had that uh, left to go is I have a bunch of models that are just kind of lying around, including one of these great old ones from Reaper. This was a Cthulhu that... I have repainted, I think, five or six times. It was on my desk uh, back when I had an office over by LAX. And it was more black, and I decided to come up more like the colors on the box and do it a little bit brighter green and uh, make the tentacles more of a purple uh, and a pink as to, in order to stand out. I went back and forth and back and forth on the biology of what Cthulhu would have. But the only real description we have of him is that he's a, a humanoid and a dragon and a squid with oily black wings all thrown in and he lives sleeping uh, under the oceans. So uh, that being the case, I just said, you know what, let's go green. We'll see what happens. Those wings can't possibly hold them aloft. They would have to be much, much bigger. Maybe they were useful in a uh, earlier phase of his life and they're starting to uh, get to the point like with a queen bee or something and they'd fall off who's to say that guy's dead uh lovecraft is dead then uh so we have some undead zombie disney princesses looks like undead snow white and these were from uh i think these are from uh the night pack of the original kickstarter for um, Black Plague uh, they came in uh, because it's got such a close Disney uh, relation but I also had um, the NPCs the the VIP zombie of uh, the fantasy world I had a, the box 2 that came in from Amazon uh, I, I, they, they slowly trickle in every once in a while cool mini or not we'll make a new batch and I managed to get these and so these were stragglers and I had everything done for Black Plague and Green Horde except the stuff that you're going to see in this video and in the RPG video. So I was just picking up stragglers and painting stuff just to have finally completed some of these games. Then we have some more. Uh, these were some type of cardinal. I think they were supposed to be the ones from the Princess Bride. Um, and I tried to paint them actual like cardinal colors. So I saw that there were some red and golds and some white and golds and I put um, the red down as the base layer uh, on the one in the center and then I went over with uh, one of the what did I use I used pucker and all that glitters I think yeah all that glitters from turbo dork in order to get the different gold colors and then I found that there was also a black uh, orthodox color for cardinals because I stupidly made the decision that I would make every single zombie in Zombicide a little bit different so that it was easy to tell which ones I had moved or not moved. So now when I go and I find these stragglers, I have to go through and make each one unique. So even though the ones on the right that you see are like the headless horseman uh, type, and I think it's supposed to be uh, inspired by Snow White and the Huntsman because other Snow White and the Huntsman stuff comes up as part of the pack, that... Um, the capes are all different colors even though they're just various shades of brown each one is unique so that each one will be unique on the table and it is a huge pain in the butt at this point because um, you can't really assembly line them as much as uh, you'd be able to otherwise but i got through it. it that is true i did make it through it and then in the last of the rpg or npc box was these elven bards and um yeah so they look a little different and then on the right, this was a rock troll that was part of the Reaper Bones 4 set that I bought on Kickstarter a few years back. And I'm just now starting to make my way painting through some of these. I painted a bunch of the giants. Uh, you'll see those as the episodes go on because they all count as stragglers <laughs> at this point. So you can see the, the difference in size between a regular um, 28 millimeter Zombicide figure and uh, this type of giant they are pretty well 
set up so that they can be used this way. Um, I mean, it's a zombie elf. If you needed a zombie elf for your uh, RPGs, then you could go pick up one of these NPC packs. They're fairly inexpensive. I do recommend to just about anybody Zombicide uh, games or any of the cool mini or not games that have multiple uh, versions of the same sculpt because they're super, super cheap compared to anything else and they are very easy to learn how to start painting on. The um, way that Cool Mini or Not requires their artists to make it um, with very exaggerated features and you can easily tell what the um, materials are and what the differences are between different parts of the body and they are no way um, realistic in the, the proportions but they feel right and they look right and if you can go in you can even paint faces and things without too much difficulty so if you are just above flat beginner if you're still if you're beyond just dipping your things in minwax and you're at the point where you can go on and do some highlights then i would suggest picking up any of these cool mini or not packs to practice with and it won't cost you as much as if you were to buy individual minis from anything else and that's going to be it from me until you listen to the RPG episode that I'm going to record right after this. I hope you guys have a good one. Um, I keep forgetting there was some other thing that I had accomplished that uh, I thought would be of some kind of interest, but I keep forgetting what it was. Um, the physics thing uh, and the, the simulated universe. I just felt pretty good after that because I worry sometimes. You know, you sit there and you're like, are we in a simulated universe? I don't do drugs, so... You know, it's just, it sticks in my head and you can't get rid of it that way. <laughs> so other people, they're like sitting there, chilling out. They got their dube, they got their whatever uh, substances, and they're relaxing with the world. Instead, I sit there with my head on the pillow and I, I try to figure out weird questions. Oh, I did have a weird question. What happened to all the unearthed arcana in the Dungeons and Dragons stuff? So I made that video. It doesn't have anything to do with board games other than Dungeons & Dragons stuff, but uh, if you like that type of content, let me know if you find that kind of thing useful. It was just, I had a question, so I figured I might as well make a video as I tried to answer it. If it's too much for the feed or anything like that, and it's too difficult for you to ignore, let me know on that end. But I figure if you don't want it, then just don't watch it. I'm not going to be insulted, but if you need it, it's there. So, yeah. You have a good one, and I'll see you on the RP.